Thanks, Tim. Uh, my name is Andy Kang. I'm the Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago. Uh, thanks so much for joining us uh, today on this Saturday. Um, for uh, full disclosure, this uh, discussion that is about to happen it has been pre-recorded so that we would uh, avoid any technical glitches uh, and we'd have a great event. Um, I I'm very excited to share that we have uh, four amazing leaders uh, joining us today for this discussion. Uh, the first is State Representative Jennifer Gong Gershwitz, uh, representing the 17th district here in Illinois. Uh, Christina Tendilia, uh, the executive director of, of FIRE Chicago. Patricia Wen, uh, the director of undergraduate studies and assistant professor of Asian American studies at Northwestern University, also co-founder of Access Labs in Uptown, uh, our, our, where our office is located. And Nikita Brar, executive director of Chicago United for Equity, or also known as Q. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those that are watching, just so you know, uh, you should see in your chat uh, the bios and the links uh, to more information about these great speakers uh, should be provided. But before we kick off into our discussion about the video that we all just watched, uh, we did want to share uh, some bonus footage that uh, we pulled from the PBS website. Uh, we thought it was super relevant to the discussion we're about to have. And so we're gonna play that right now for all of you. It runs about two minutes, and then we're gonna uh, begin the discussion with the speakers. I remember we were working when my father says, come on, we're, we're leaving. I says, we're leaving, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so we left. To go on a strike, uh, you suffer a lot of hardship. Uh, Maybe you get hungry, maybe you're gonna lose your car, maybe you're gonna lose your house. And I remember leaving the field and driving through the, uh, seeing the strikers of the Filipinos. But the Filipinos face a dilemma. As they strike for a union, the farmers bring in Mexican workers to replace them. It's one of the things I learned that the farmers like to do. They like to pit the Mexicans against the Filipinos because you're going to be fighting for the same pot of gold. Many Mexican laborers have already joined the National Farm Workers Association, led by the charismatic Cesar Chavez. I remember meeting at the Filipino Community Hall in Toledo. All the labor contractors were there. And a lot of the farm workers were there and they're trying to decide, are we going to end the strike? Or are we going to negotiate with the Mexicans to join us? And then Larry at Leon says, I'm going to go talk to the Mexicans. When the strike happens, Cesar Chavez wasn't really quite ready. But Cesar also knew that if they didn't join the Filipinos then, then it would never happen. Larry approaches Cesar Chavez and his colleague, Dolores Huerta, as one of AWOC's co-founders, her relationship with Larry and the Filipinos goes back years. And then a couple days later, we're at this church. They're talking about the strike. They're discussing, should we go on strike or not go on strike? And all of a sudden, there's a swaga. I said, what the heck, swaga? Because I thought they were saying, hell no. I said, no, it means strike. We're going on strike. And so the Mexicans joined us. So that, of course, was the story of the 1965 uh, farm workers strike uh, that is very well known, um, more so for Cesar Chavez. We thought it was really important uh, to share that story for purpose of this discussion. Um, so I'm going to jump us off with one question uh, that I'd love to hear from our, our esteemed panelists. Um, just watching that video, your thoughts, your feelings, uh, what moved you uh, from the video? Uh, and, and yeah, just share uh, from your perspective uh, as Asian Americans, um, what those were. Well, I'm happy to start. Um, for me, watching these moments, I felt a, a personal connection to these stories. And, it, and for me, it was, it, it was a reminder of the power of our shared experiences um, but more than anything else, it just hit me on an emotional level. So thank you. 
Yeah, um, again, so Christina and um, I'm the executive director of Alliance of Filipinos for Immigrant Rights and Empowerment. And I gotta say, just watching that clip, um, it always uh, just grounds me in just this rich history of organizing that happened with the Filipino OEX community, with the, with the broader Asian community, and also these examples of solidarity with other communities. Um, and remembering also that struggle. And something that struck me too is that um, it didn't just happen. They didn't just say, okay, we'll work together. Um, but there was deep relationships between workers and organizers that allowed um, that solidarity to happen. And so for me, watching that um, is really powerful and it really grounds me to think about uh, the struggle today for immigrants, um, for, uh, for workers. You're on mute, Patricia. On mute. <laughs> Darn. Okay. Nope. Um, so this documentary series is really powerful um, as it traces the history of um, Asian Americans uh, from the Chinese Exclusion Act all the way to post 9-11 um, and really thinking and seeing the expansiveness of that history um, and the power of people mobilizing and organizing together that is centralized in this piece that I think is really significant, especially as it speaks to this moment um, and the ways in which, as you were talking about the importance of um, solidarity, right? The importance of cross-racial alliances as people, laborers go on strike. And in this moment, we see essential workers a lot who are undocumented, a lot of people who are immigrants and refugees who are on the front line in food services and meatpacking um, industries in um, nur as nurses, right? Uh, predominantly, a lot of nurses are Filipino, Filipinx, right? Um, so how do we think about the history and the legacy of this work um, as a way to encourage us um, in this moment um, to think about what we can do, how we can come together. And so for me, it was a hopeful um, opening in, re in reviewing this history again. Yeah, I, I think building off of that, Patricia, I feel like the, the component of history in, in sort of figuring out who we are uh, and how we belong in this country and what our story of belonging is, is so important. Um, I think a lot about, you know, in my own upbringing, um, watching media like this is just not something that I grew up with. Um, but I was really lucky because my dad is just like a, you know, homegrown historian um, and told us a lot about the stories of, of our people and what we went through um, in the partition. And um, my family, you know, lived at the um, intersection of what is now Pakistan and India. Um, and what it meant for, for our family to have lines drawn for us by people who are not us um, and to, to live with the legacy of that forever. Um, so when I see this clip, it really reminds me of the power of what it means to come together and to see, you know, it's really easy to see folks as other than us. Um, it's almost instinctual, right, to, to try to gravitate towards a group we see as, as us. Um, but growing up in, as sort of the only Indian kid, the only sick kid in my, um, in my class, pretty much always, um, I couldn't look at everybody as other, otherwise I, was, I would literally be on my own all the time. And so I often tended to find similarities, uh, whether that was affection for Star Wars or like obsession with the bulls or whatever it was, right? And so... When I look at this clip, I, I think about the power of finding stories of similarity and how incredibly important it is. And we can't do that unless we have stories that we lean into and um, actually understand where we come from, where our people come from, um, and then look for understanding uh, with groups that aren't, um, don't share our particular history. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. I, you know, uh, just as we transition to the next question, one of the things that really struck me was, um, which I was really uh, pleased to see, is uh, female voices and the stories of women uh, and how they're experiencing these different stories uh, were being really showcased and, and 
you know, grounded uh, the whole story and uh, whether it was Teresa Lee or even uh, the, the first story or even with the murder of Vincent Chen, um, uh, not just Helen Zia, but in particular, uh, Vincent's mother uh, getting uh, the focus of, of the story of uh, the courage and, and the strength she had to overcome that trauma. So, um, you know, I think that that was really moving for me as someone who has uh, nieces that I also hope uh, will, will be part of that better world in the future. Um, speaking of the future, uh, all of you are doing such amazing work uh, on behalf of the community right now. Uh, and I'm curious uh, if you could speak a little bit about uh, thoughts that you saw in the video or some of the stories and trends that we've maybe touched on a little bit here. Uh, how are you thinking about how it connects to the things that you're doing right now uh, in your work on behalf of the community? Well, um, I am, uh, as, as most of you know, I think the only immigration lawyer in the Illinois General Assembly. And my own family's history has uh, been really the driving force behind most of my professional career. My own family faced deportation under the Chinese Exclusion Acts, but I think like a lot of Asian American families, or at least in my family, speaking from my own experience, our family struggle was not something that my grandparents talked about a lot. Um, I don't know if it was because they were so in the moment trying to achieve the American dream, or if it was a little bit of, of wanting just to continue to move forward and not focus on the past. But for me, discovering my own sense of purpose, discovering my own sense of self, meant looking at my family's history, meant looking back and connecting to what made me, me. And I discovered in law school, my own family's struggle under the Chinese Exclusion Acts, not realizing that it wasn't until those acts were repealed in 1943 that my family was able to own property in their own name. The things that were denied to my grandparents as immigrants to this country at a time when all immigration from China was illegal based solely on race. And I don't think that as a policymaker, as a lawmaker, you can ignore the legal racism that has been infused in our immigration policy without a sense of our own history, how can you expect to do better in the future? So reminding ourselves of our own American history, Asian American history, our connection to these struggles of the past informs how we confront them today. And I think we have examples all around us right now of how important it is to connect to those same struggles. Because it is something that Patricia said really resonated with me. You, you talked about looking at these stories for a sense of hope. And I feel hope and optimism all the time in our shared experiences, the things that, that have defined who we are. Um, but it's also empowering to go back and connect and to remember that those same issues confront us now. Um, and the more that we can build coalitions around uh, these, these shared values, the better we will be able to construct policy around the values that we know make us stronger as a society, make us stronger as a community. And so for me, it is my family's own history our own struggles um, that inspired me to go to law school, um, inspired me to run for a seat in the General Assembly, inspire me to seek connections um, with those who share my desire to make a difference in the world. And um, I, I firmly believe um, that you cannot do better until you know better. And so it's important to look back as we move forward. Thank you, Jennifer. I mean, the Patsy Mink story, being told by the boys club to wait your turn, right? Uh, I'm sure that's something you can relate to. And uh, on the immigration front, 
we did just recently see a, a suspension of all uh, an effort to suspend all immigration uh, as we know it. it does kind of hark back not just to the Chinese Exclusion Act, but um, you know, and maybe we forgot a little bit. In addition to the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1924, all immigration from Asia w was banned, right? And so, uh, uh, hopefully, we're not seeing uh, history repeating itself there. But uh, others, uh, I know you're all doing amazing work in community. Uh, we'd love for our audience to hear more about that. But also, yeah, your thoughts about how it connects to to what uh, what we're seeing in in, in this video. Uh, Chris, Chris, could you uh, maybe kick us off? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, there's so much to say thinking about how these these stories of struggle um, and these these themes around solidarity, themes around um, a lot of these um, the women that were featured in the, the documentary. I think about that a lot in terms of. Um, how many more people who who um, also were a part of the struggle um, around Asian American organizing and the movement. Um, and I'm particularly thinking about that um, in the work that I'm doing today around immigrant and worker rights um, and the fight for um, domestic workers for um, their labor rights, um, their access to health care. And just like the farm workers where that work, uh, because of who they were, that was not valued, it's the same thing. And, and today you're hearing it, seeing it in an intersectional way because it's women's work, because um, people are immigrants, because people are undocumented. Um, and so I really, I really uh, think that those connections um, connect to uh, that history in here today. We're seeing that, and so we really can learn from what um, those struggles from the past. Um, and, and for me, seeing that history and knowing as a young person, I was lucky to, uh, high school, be able to learn about Asian, Asian American organizing when I know a lot of people weren't. Um, and so for me, that, uh, I really resonated with what, I think it was Mi Moa um, said in the, in the documentary about how it, something clicked for her um, around, this is, how, this is how my experience is connected to this broader movement. And um, I think it really pushed me and motivated me to do this work as an, as an organizer, to work in community. Um, I don't think a lot of people are like, yes, this is the career that I'm gonna do. <laughs> it's because we have to, it's a part of our experience, our lives. Um, and particularly around, I think about um, immigrant rights when our families are being torn apart. Um, there's kind of the story of, you know, people coming to the United States and it's this kind of like, fuzzy like American dream and open arms. And I think something that I resonate with is that the other, the story to that is actually um, there, um, when they went to Ellis Island, that it actually wasn't just this open arms thing, that there was, it was a place where people were getting detained and there was violence um, and families were separated. And so I think about that, those lessons and those histories um, and uh, bring them, uh, I see them um, showing up today and wanting to continue to uh, fight against again, fight back against those policies. Um, so there is a lot of ways that I want to respond to um, the question of how this work impacts us in the current work that we're doing. Um, for me, I'm thinking about it. Um, in terms of like the layering of history that's happening and the um, things that are happening so close to each other, right? Like um, I'm thinking about Vincent Chin um, and his death in 1982 um, and the end of the Vietnam War that happens like just um, a few years earlier in 1975, right? And then a few years before that, um, in 1968, the Third World Liberation Front that sought to um, begin um, well, 
it should be third world studies, but now it's known as critical ethnic studies. And I could go into that a little bit later too, but just how all these histories are happening, um, like not in a linear way to one another, right? Like there is no clear progress narrative. Um, it's constantly imbued with like, um, political and people struggles to fight for their rights, to fight for um, better working and living conditions in many different ways. Um, and so I was thinking about it in relationship to this time period, right? The late 1970s, the early 1980s, um, because my parents are Vietnamese refugees. My father um, and mother um, escaped from Vietnam after the Vietnam American War, and my father was actually imprisoned for four years um, in re-education camps. And so I was really interested in issues of, um, or I am really interested in issues of state violence um, and incarceration as a result of that um, in many different ways. But I'm thinking about like, how does this history localize itself within the Chicago context, within the Uptown context, within the context of Argyle Street, which is located in Uptown, um, that is more recently historically known as like a Southeast Asian neighborhood and district, right? Um, what does it mean that in this moment in the late 1970s, you have this wave of Southeast Asians um, being forced to migrate and resettle in the United States context because of the loss of the war, right? Um, and so we see the surge of like Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Laotian. Um, simultaneously, we also see um, like the Great Migration, um, where there's like white Appalachians moving um, and organizing with the Black Panther Party in uptown um, on issues of class, on issues of just like um, really breaking down how we're thinking about uh, just working conditions and living conditions, right? Um, and that we see this like cross-racial solidarity that's happening as this area is also being gentrified. So you see this layering of history that's happening um, that's really interesting to me and so um, what I'm actually interested, I know this is um, for later, but just thinking about um, how um, uh, I lost my train of thought, but <laughs> just thinking about how like um, this documentary might unfold um, in regards to um, these, these shared history with other um, racialized groups, that it's not just contained within uh, how we loosely define Asian America, um, but how are we thinking about it in relationships to, in relationship to Latinx communities, in relationship to Native American communities, and in relationship to um, Black communities, right, um, that are completely racialized and racialized differently, and that it's all um, uh, within the same system that when we're thinking about the Chinese Exclusion Act, or we're thinking about um, these acts that um, seek to deport um, Southeast Asians, that it's not disconnected from uh, the anti-Black violence that's happening in the United States context as well. So just um, just thinking about how all that relates to each other. Definitely, definitely. Um, Nikita? Yeah, I think when I when I think about how this documentary um, inspires and connects with uh, the work that I get to do at Q, I often think about, you know, this very simple theme of belonging um, and who, who sort of is seen as having the right to a voice, the right to civic power, um, and how that's divided and how we're often, so often pitted against each other. And um, in Chicago, Q got started because of uh, a fight for my local neighborhood school. Um, and the school district sort of challenging the right of the school boundaries to exist where they were um, and trying to change those boundaries, frankly. And, and in many ways, when they were, when, when we started to say, no, that's not acceptable. Um, and the community that was organizing there was predominantly black. It's a predominantly black school. And uh, when, when that community started to organize, the district's response was to sort of uh, say, well, we're actually doing this on behalf of Asian Americans because Chinatown is right next door and has been asking for a high school for such a long time. And so sort of uh, my own personal identity being between two worlds, right, and in this space was really um, 
this incredible moment to sort of realize why it is that my dad kept telling us these stories at the dinner table about division and factions and identities and um, the ways in which there's this false narrative about our differences. And um, many of those themes keep coming out over and over again. And the idea that, you know, there is this, um, uh, there's just not enough. There's just not enough money. There's just not enough resources. There's just not enough power for all of you to have a say, right? Um, so, so Q's work um, came out of that particular case and we really started to organize and we started to say that civil rights work in the modern era cannot be legal work exclusively. It needs to start with hearts and minds, but not stop there. There's a lot of this idea that you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is about people understanding their implicit biases. And I would challenge that and say that it, understanding your implicit biases without working for policy change, without working for legislative action, without creating a different power structure is frankly uh, a feel-good strategy and a band-aid on many of the challenges we see in our world. So Q's work is about how do we organize Right? How do we start with hearts and minds and seeing each other for who we are and our similarities and then work from there to get to changing narratives and from changing narratives to changing laws and policies. And so in that case at NTA where we were founded, we were actually able to um, secure the first time in national history uh, that we were able to stop a school closure on civil rights grounds because it violated and had a disproportionate harm on black students. That's not a thing that um, we often say. Even if we know it's true, we're not able to prove it. Um, and so the work we're doing is about thinking through, first of all, how do we connect people's stories to one another? How can I see your humanity as part of my humanity? And that all of our uh, futures are tied in the same, in the same thread. And that um, if I believe in a democracy, if I believe in the idea that my voice matters, and I have to believe in the idea that your voice matters. And that, in fact, sometimes it's not about making sure that people whose voices have always been part of the political process are still there, but instead to say who's been excluded and how do we center those conversations and those harms that have been uh, part of our history. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, a mission of my organization, Advancing Justice, is racial equity, and it's it's not in parentheses racial equity just for Asian Americans, right? Uh, it's for everybody, and we all, I think, many of us that we we've, we've just shared that know what it's like to not be heard and not be seen, and we certainly, uh, as we fight for justice, don't want to do the same thing to other groups, right? While we're doing that, and uh, I, you know, I. Just hearing Christina, I, I know uh, it's, it, it takes a lot of intentional work to even have a Pan-Asian uh, 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 unity and coalition. Uh, we're both uh, members of the Pan-Asian Voter Empowerment Coalition that uh, have been working with Jennifer for the last several years. Uh, but we're also members of the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant Refugee Rights. And that takes, you know, those are uh, communities of color from all different immigrant communities. And that takes a lot of work to hear each other and listen to each other. and. Um, you know, not try to gloss over the tougher conversations that we saw, um, you know, for example, with the Filipino farm workers, right, uh, taking that brave step, reaching out to, the, to their Mexican uh, workers and, and building real solidarity. And, um, you know, I, last tidbit before we, we turn to the positive, I hope, or uh, the future is, uh, you know, I, I, I did notice uh, in the Vincent Chin story, uh, Reverend Jackson and the Rainbow Push folks uh, speaking. Uh, in solidarity with, with the Chen family and, um, you know, being reminded that, you know, this has happened before, all right, that folks have done this work, the work that Nikita is doing, uh, that many of you are doing, it is possible. It's not easy, but it, it is possible. And it's encouraging to see that even decades ago, uh, that was happening. So, um, so I'm going to turn uh, us a little more forward looking uh, with this series and, and just ask all of you, um, you know, this is going to be preparing on May 11th on PBS uh, and then May 12th uh, as well uh, to finish out the five part docuseries. What are you hopes for the series? Uh, what are you most excited to see or learn or, or um, and then also related to that, um, just how might we use this series, uh, you know, in the future or in the near future uh, to, to mobilize the community to affect change and make the progress that some of you have spoken about. But um, yeah, I would love to hear from all of you. Well, um, 
first, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity to be with all of you um, at a time when it's so important that we continue to find ways to reach out and to connect. It has been such an honor to be with you all. Um, for me, if people take one thing, one thing from watching this series, I hope they take away that we matter. Our history matters. Our shared struggles, our sacrifices, our dreams show our interconnectedness, not only to each other, but to the world. And that we gain only what we are willing to fight for. That, you know, to, to your point, Andy, about being seen and not heard. Um, this is, this is one of those things that um, in politics we struggle with a lot. Prior to uh, Representative Teresa Ma being the first Asian American ever elected to the Illinois General Assembly, there were no Asian American voices in the Illinois legislature. Now there are two, with me being the second in the House and then with uh, Senator Ron Villavalam in the Senate. There are three Asian Americans for the first time in Illinois history representing Asian American voices in the legislature. That is progress, but we had to fight for it. We had to fight for it. We had to fight for it by making sure that we had a representative map that would enable Asian influenced voices to be elected we had to fight for it by working with coalitions to build power and influence. And I think sometimes as Asian Americans, we feel like we can't demand to be seen. We can't demand to be heard. Um, but I think if, if this documentary has taught us anything, it's how important it is to be visible, to be part of the conversation, to build coalitions and so for me um, I take away from this a renewed sense of purpose a renewed connection to my own family was ahead of her time. She came to this country before women were allowed to vote. She was a teacher. She was one of the most important influences in my life. She always taught me that I could be anything in this country. She didn't um, live to see me elected to the Illinois General Assembly. I hope that through our work, we honor that history, not only our own personal histories, but the shared struggles and experiences of all of us, because that's what makes us Americans. That's what makes us Americans. And the American dream belongs to each and every one of us, and it's worth fighting for. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for giving us this moment and I hope that it continues to inspire others. Thank you. Others? Yeah, I will, you know, what I would say in terms of um, what I want to see with this, um, this document, the series, is I hope people use it as a launching point to have these conversations and really reflect on um, what was the history and struggle of our community? And um, seeing that it was um, a part of that struggle was uh, uh, seeing workers, seeing um, parents, seeing families um, coming together and building solidarity with other communities um, and struggling through that. But um, in the end, coming together and, and, um, and fighting for their rights. Um, and so, from those lessons, I really hope that people take from that a, a moment for us to think about what is the long haul um, a vision 
for us to build with other communities in order to make sure that all of us thrive, um, whether it's in the Asian, um, Asian, Black, Latinx, Indigenous communities, um, and making sure that we're in relationship with other communities along the way. Um, and knowing that we're a part of this broader movement. Um, and so for me, I really, really am um, excited to have this film um, provide, that, provide that space for people to start thinking about. And think about what are the values that we're going to instill in the way that um, we, we build a movement. Um, and those values are around um, you know, dismantling white supremacy, um, making sure that we are fighting back against the model minority myth that we can't be silent. Silence or compliance does not mean your safety. And it's also our duty to, it's our duty not um, to fight for our communities. Um, and so that's something I really hope people uh, take away from this film. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll end with just remembering um, one of the, the, um, the popular things that they would say at the, the um, farm workers meetings is, is sang baksak, which means one fall, um, which translates to one fall in Tagalog, uh, which is basically uh, this idea of, of solidarity and that all of us are connected and um, drawn together. And so um, that that is our work and um, that we have to make sure that um, we're supporting each other and fighting for each other um, because our, our liberation is, is really connected in that way. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Patricia, Nikita? Uh, absolutely. Um, before I continue, I just wanted to thank um, Advancing Justice for hosting this. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel with everyone here um, and to hear you all reflect about the powerful work that you're doing um, and um, the heart with which you enter this, this, this continued struggle in many ways. Um, for me, in this documentary series, I'm interested in seeing um, three aspects actually. One is like the intergenerational connections, um, just kind of uh, drawing from um, what Jennifer shared about your grandmother, um, just thinking about um, my own father um, having escaped war, but he's been a community organizer in Chicago for over 40 years. Um, and we see also in the documentary, we see intergenerational struggles of mothers and daughters, of mothers and sons, right, of, of um, parents and their children and the generations after. Um, so I'm really interested in this notion of togetherness, of what it means to fight for each other in both like um, the traditional notions of family, but in a more expansive notion of family um, in the way that uh, as echoing what Christina was saying, our liberation is tied up in one another's liberation in many ways. And how do we ground ourselves from that point as a place of continued um, struggle? Um, the second thing that I'm really interested in is artistic production. Like Asian American cultural production is really beautiful and amazing in different ways. Um, how has cultural production and artistic practice been used um, to mobilize people? How has it been used to to um, make our stories um, heard and centered in these various ways. Um, and for me, I'm thinking about it in relationship to Asian American spoken word artists who were so pivotal in the 90s um, for um, politicizing a lot of young people um, in the United States context. Uh, and then the last piece that I'm really interested in seeing is just like how have people mobilized? Um, what are some of the strategies and tactics um, and what are the like historical political contexts that they were working in and struggling through? How can we learn from their lessons in terms of like what has worked, what hasn't worked um, and the bonds that have kept them together in different ways? Um, and what does that look like um, cross-racially, right? That it's not just within 
Asian America as like a fixed identity of sorts, right? Because it's not, it's a, it's a political identity in many ways. It's a tool of a collectively mobilizing together. And so how has that been used with other racialized communities of color? Um, and how can we continue to um, enact that in different ways? Um, and the way that I, I see this documentary series as a tool of mobilization is through education. For me, um, I teach in Asian American studies at Northwestern but I also teach community classes um, in Uptown, teach-ins, workshops, um, and I'm really interested in the form of the documentary um, as a vehicle that allows people's voices, people who actually experience these histories um, and their families' experiences to share it and for people to feel that history um, through the retelling and the importance and power of narrative and what it offers, especially um, in thinking about what does it mean to work in a field that fought like literally the third world liberation front that fought for ethnic studies that what it manifests today to be in 1968 they were hosed down they were met with police batons and extreme violence just to ask for curriculum, just to ask for a non-Eurocentric curriculum that centers their people's history, their people's struggles, and to um, shed light on histories of colonialism and US imperialism. So what does it mean to continue that fight to learn these histories so that we don't repeat them? Definitely. So that we can have a better future. Yeah, yeah. Nikita. Yeah, I mean, I I, Patricia, I love what you said about, you know, our, our families and the idea of this expansive family. So, so kind of like pulling on that string, I think my, my first hope is for our uh, Pan-Asian American family and for people watching, you know, um, we have so few images of representation um, in, in the public narrative. And oftentimes it's, you know, Frankly, it's um, Asian American representation for white gays. Um, you know, Asian Americans cast into roles hunting down terrorists on primetime television is not the kind of representation that um, speaks to me. But I think about this series as being the kind of representation that would have been really in incredible for you know a 13-year-old version of me. Um, I was in my freshman year of high school when 9/11 happened. Um, and so growing up in a household and, and having family get togethers with men who wore turbans and then living in a world where that was told to me that that's what made us unsafe. Like we were not to be trusted. We're not fully American, right? So seeing this version of what it means to have an Asian American story, not an Asian story, not an American story, like truly the intersection of our identities and our history in this space. Um, and what belonging means for us is really powerful. And I, I specifically want to think about the, the beautiful way in which women's uh, representation was weaved into the storytelling in this series is really powerful. Because I think many times, right, there's this idea of Asian American women being subservient and docile um, and not having a voice, right? And this, this is an incredibly, I mean, it's a very Western, um, backwards idea, frankly, of feminism, that um, because we have, uh, you know, cultural practices that are different, that we don't have a, a beautiful celebration of power. And I'm not saying that from my generation. I'm saying that because the stories I grew up on are of my great grandmother, who was widowed at a time where property rights were not given to women anywhere, um, certainly not in India. And she still fought to make sure that her daughter had a college education, became a teacher for her community. So the power of women's storytelling in the Asian American storytelling um, in this series was really powerful to me. And I hope that um, our Asian American uh, community, our family watching this is able to take that and say, you don't actually, not only are we not a model minority, right, but that um, the stories of sort of fitting in, not challenging the status quo, not challenging white supremacy, um, that's not our role. Our role has always been to challenge and to disrupt and to further thinking, right? Um, and so I really hope for folks who are watching, um, you know, Latinx folks, Black folks, Indigenous folks, white folks, 
who don't have the same Asian American history that we do, that they're able to watch these stories and hear and think about where our stories intersect and hopefully find, um, find those moments where our struggles intersect and where there's sort of this, oh, that makes sense why we would do this work together, why it's not just about um, us showing up on the front lines kind of from an idea of mutual liberation, but from an appreciation that these are our shared struggles. This is part of my lineage. This is my family's legacy, just as it's your family's legacy. Definitely. Um, and for me, I, I just share, I hope everyone watches it, uh, not just the Asian American community. I, we know, and you know, Nikita, similar to you, growing up here in the Midwest, I didn't hear any of this history until I got to college, you know, and, and so my hope is that uh, for the next generation of uh, students that uh, they're exposed to this sooner, that they don't have to work, wait, no offense to Patricia, they don't have to wait till they get to undergrad in Asian American studies, uh, which is fantastic that it exists, but uh, we want to start uh, the conversation even earlier so that uh, these stories are in our subconscious as we um, try to process even the current right, uh, which uh, we all know is uh, kind of bananas, right? Um, so uh, there's that. And uh, to the greater, to non-Asian Americans, to other Americans, I hope uh, those watching today that uh, you, uh, as allies, as partners in this work, uh, that you'll encourage your friends, your family, people you know, uh, to also watch, right? And, and have those conversations about uh, how the Asian American story fits into this larger story that uh, we're, we're trying to weave together. So um, I am so grateful uh, for all four of you joining. Um, Patricia, Nikita, Jennifer, Christina, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us, uh, for uh, watching the video and taking the time out of your very busy schedules to, to have this important conversation. Uh, we, we are so grateful here at Advancing Justice uh, to have you all as partners uh, in this work. Uh, so thank you. Thanks once again for everybody for joining us today uh, for this important conversation and this pre-screening event. Um, as far as Asian American Advancing Justice, uh, Chicago, and our work in the near-term future, um, we look forward to working uh, and following the lead of uh, our partner of FIRE as they fight for uh, family medical leave uh, on the state level. Uh, we also will continue to do outreach around the 2020 census. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please continue uh, respond to the census, tell your friends and family. Uh, and then two new initiatives that we'll, we'll be launching uh, this May uh, going into the summer. Uh, one is uh, in partnership with PBS, the Advancing Justice Affiliation will be releasing a kindergarten through 12th grade uh, Asian American school curriculum. Uh, we'll be fighting uh, on the local level here in Illinois for the TEACH campaign, which is teaching equitable Asian American community history. Uh, as we've discussed and we've, we've uh, learned, it's really important that these stories are taught in public schools, uh, that our, our young students uh, know these stories and, and can learn from them, uh, and, and hopefully we can uh, do better in the future. Uh, and then the second initiative, in response to the hate incidents and the troubling news that we've seen um, uh, around the country, uh, we'll be launching a bystander intervention trainings. Uh, this is a way of us equipping community members and allies uh, to have some very uh, safe, uh, common sense uh, tools at their disposal to uh, disrupt and de-escalate uh, verbal harassment and potential hate incidents. And so uh, if you'd like more information on that, please follow us on social media, sign up for our email newsletter to get those updates. Um, and so as you can see, we have a lot of work uh, to do in the near future. Um, all of that uh, to those of you that provide us financial assistance uh, that are donors, thank you so much. For those of you that uh, are are not currently uh, donating to Advancing Justice, please consider becoming a monthly giver. Um, it's really important that uh, we have the resources available to do this work. Uh, so thank you in advance for, for joining us in that fight. We, we desperately need you uh, and every little bit uh, matters. Um, finally, uh, I'd like to thank once again the panelists for joining us. Uh, our amazing partner, WTTW, that helped host this event. Uh, please consider becoming a member of, of uh, WTTW if you are not already. Uh, they are putting on programming like this Asian American docu-series. And then to our larger funders uh, that make all of this possible, uh, a big, big, big thank you uh, with a special shout out uh, to one of our largest supporters, the Wallace H. Coulter Foundation. Uh, in closing, um, to those of you that are essential workers, 
uh, our deepest gratitude uh, for your courage and your service in, during this time. Uh, for the rest of us, I pray we'll all stay home, uh, stay safe, uh, and we will get through this pandemic together. So thank you once again. I'm going to kick it back to Tim at this moment, but uh, thank you so much.